Good job, guys. Way to go, Jake. That was great. Awesome. Well, guys, I'm excited to be with you this morning. Wasn't worship and communion incredible? That was really, really awesome. Um, a couple things I'm really excited about today because we are going to jump into a new series. We are going to jump into a new series on the Beatitudes, right? The Beatitudes, and we're going to walk through the next several weeks unpacking each one of these Beatitudes. Um, but before I begin, I want to share just kind of a quick testimony slash update. Amber and I uh, left last weekend. We went to Charlotte and Raleigh, and I have some uh, really good friend that does campus ministry in Charlotte. Uh, their ministry is called Ignite Movement, really called to Gen Z and, and helping raise up prayer, discipleship, and evangelism communities on the college campuses in the Southeast. And we got some time to spend with those guys, and we were sitting at a table with other pastors and leaders, and this was, um, it was really, it was, I mean, it was sad in one sense, but it was also encouraging in the next. And Amber and I really didn't know any of these leaders, and we just got paired together in a table, and we were just basically asking the questions that they gave us. But it turns out that a lot of the churches, several of the ones that we talked to in different parts of North Carolina, other places, were actually going through very similar things to what our church just walked through in the last several months. I mean, just really heartbreaking stuff. And it was just an opportunity for Amber and I to actually connect with them and to be a source of encouragement to them and them also be a source of encouragement to us. Um, and so as wild as that sounds, it did, we found, we found such encouragement from the Lord that, wow, across the board, the Lord is really moving in his church. He really is, even though it's been hard and difficult. And I just know a little bit to know this much. The Lord has a way of taking the good, the bad, and the ugly and using it for his glory and his purpose. Isn't that great news? I mean, that's Jesus. That's the Lord. So it was just really exciting to connect with other leaders um, from the region and to be able to be a source of encouragement and strength also for what they're walking through. Um, so it was, a, it was a really good. But as I was away last weekend, the Lord dropped this in my spirit about the Beatitudes and about really unpacking this. And I think it's very foundational. So I want to begin to share um, briefly about this. So this is actually one of my favorite portions of Scripture. If you've never read it, I encourage you to stick close to this. It's great. The Beatitudes are the beginning of what is called famously the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gives in Matthew's, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. But the Beatitudes hold a special place. And here's the way I like to think about it. I like to uh, throw a little government and history in it. So do we have that slide, Mo? I think I had a slide of, um, here we go. The two most important documents in our country's history, right, is the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. I was talking with the team earlier. Have you seen some of those reels that go around where people are on the street and they're interviewing, hey, who's the first president of the United States or what do you know about the government? And the, the answers are just kind of, it's kind of scary. People don't know. But the guys passed the test this morning. They did really good. These are two of the most important documents that we have. And I want us to see this, that the Declaration was written before the Constitution. And basically, it was the forerunner. So at, at, a, at a synopsis point of view, the direction was that. It was a declaring from Britain that we are no longer going to be part of that nation. We're actually going to form a new nation, and we're going to have our own new government, right? And that's pretty much the purpose of the Declaration. But it doesn't really tell you exactly what our government is going to look like and how it's going to work. That's where the U.S. Constitution comes in that was written just a few years later. So where the Declaration proclaimed what was coming, it was actually the Constitution that laid out how we will actually function as a nation in our government. Are you with me? In the same way, I want you to look, that, look at that as John the Baptist and Jesus. See, John the Baptist, when the whole New Testament opens, he was a forerunner, and he was preparing the way by declaring that a new kingdom was on the horizon. 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and when this begins to happen, there's no prophet, there's no voice in that time period. So when John begins to open his mouth and declare the word of the Lord, it is much like the declaration of not independence, but our dependence on God and the coming kingdom. 
But it's not until Jesus arrives and begins to step into his role as the King of Kings and begins his ministry that he actually teaches us what this kingdom looks like and how it operates. So I want you to always remember when you think of the Sermon of the Mount, it is the constitution of the kingdom. Just as the articles were written in our constitution, this is the Sermon of the Mount. And Jesus is drawing us in, and he's saying, I'm going to actually lay out the value system of my kingdom. And the Beatitudes work as the preamble of that constitution. The eight Beatitudes are the core values of the kingdom. And so that's why I feel it's very important to know this, and that we begin to actually unpack it together for the next several weeks. So I'd love to start by reading it. So let's go to Matthew 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. And it says this, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain where he sat down and his disciples came to him. I love how Jesus fulfills everything in the Old Testament, just as the Ten Commandments were given on a mountain. Here Jesus is coming with the Beatitudes on a mountain to begin to outline the kingdom. And the first one he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Man, that one seems to hit, doesn't it? And speak all kind of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Holy Spirit, I just pray for the next few moments that you would unlock your word in us. That it would go so deep in our soul and our spirit that we would connect and see you in this word in a way we've never seen you before. We come to you willing to listen and willing to learn willing to understand something new. So we, re, we yield ourselves to you. Get me out of the way and release your word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Awesome. All right. Beatitude number one. So this Sunday, we're going to focus on the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's start here. This first... Beatitude is huge. It's massive. In fact, it's the opening door, if you will, to the rest of the Beatitudes. It's similar to when Paul lays out the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what the first fruit mentioned in Galatians 5 is out of the fruits of the Spirit? It is love, joy, peace, patience, etc. Well, I've learned that outside of uh, love, I don't know if you can really have true patience or true joy or true peace. Love is the product that produces all of those other fruits. In the same way, it is this first beatitude that produces the rest. Did you notice as we read through them, you have some parts of the kingdom like, you know, blessed are those who mourn for they'll be comforted. You get these, these aspects of the kingdom, but this first one is powerful because you don't just get an aspect of the kingdom. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the whole kingdom. Like we have access to the whole kingdom if we understand what it means to be poor in spirit. This being poor in spirit is the beginning of the character of the Christian. It is the formation process. It is the beginning formation process of us becoming more like Christ, of us becoming more like Jesus. It is the beginning, and it gives us this access. Two words to note is the word happy and the word poor. Well, I said happy, blessed, and the word poor. 
So in the Greek, bless actually means happy. But if you do a little research, you'll find out Greek scholars felt that happy didn't quite totally embrace the whole concept of what Jesus was saying. And that's why they use the word blessed. Like you are blessed. In other words, God's favor is on you and you will be content in that joy all of your life if you begin to connect, adapt, cling to these values that Jesus is mentioning to us. You'll be happy. I mean, isn't that the pursuit of a lot of people, even us, right? We're always looking for that some sense of significance, that, that sense of gratitude, that sense of contentment. You know, we tend to think jobs will do it, relationships will do it, friendships will do it, marriage will do it, kids will do it, money will do it. But in the end, it all leaves us wanting for more, doesn't it? It doesn't fully satisfy. But there's something here that Jesus is teaching us. He says, but if you understand what it means in stepping into being poor in spirit, you will find the joy and the contentment and the happiness and the favor that you so long for. But I think for you, for me, for many of us, I think the question today is, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does that actually even mean to be poor in spirit? So let's start here. To understand poor in spirit and what Jesus is saying, it's very important that we understand that there's three concepts of poverty mentioned in the Bible. There's three concepts of poverty mentioned in the Bible. The first concept is lack. You can just read that throughout the scriptures. Lack. Lack is I never have enough. I have some, but I never have enough. You can see that in the scriptures. We could probably all raise our hands and say, well, I've experienced that at some point in my life. Some of you may be like, I'm there right now, right? You have just enough. You cannot tap into the overflow or the abundance. And, and you're always, right, having more, needing more, wanting more. There's lack. It's, it's, it's a level of poverty in the Bible. The second one is nothing. So the first one is you have just enough. The second one is I actually have nothing. I've lost it all. I've lost my family, my house, maybe homeless. Like I have nothing to my name, no material possessions. I remember when we were in the early days, Aaron and I, college. Have any of you guys been through college? You ever just have the, you were just, college students are just broke. I felt so bad for my buddy last weekend. They were taking up an offering. I mean, it's great. It's 200 kids that are on fire, Gen Z, but all of them are broke. <laughs> And the Lord provides in miraculous ways. But, I mean, it's just, I, I know that feeling. I think some of us also know that concept, that, that having nothing, right? And then there's the third concept, which I call permanent indebtedness. Permanent indebtedness or bankruptcy is another word to put it. And what I mean by that is I am permanently bankrupt. And this poverty goes beyond the first two. This poverty is more than just not having enough or more than um, having nothing, losing it all. Permanent indebtedness means that I am indebted for the rest of my life, that I am in so much debt it's impossible for me to get out of. I am bankrupt. I am helpless. I cannot do this on my own. So when we read Jesus' words, blessed are the poor in spirit, that word poor in the Greek refers to this third concept of poverty. What Jesus is saying is, is those who are spiritually bankrupt, those who recognize that they are spiritually indebted to God and to Jesus, those are the ones who will begin to inherit the kingdom of God. Man, blessed are those who realize they're spiritually in debt to everything he has done on the cross. It's recognizing that we don't bring anything to the table. We don't bring any worth or value to what and who Jesus is. That even in all of our goodness and, and, and good works and good deeds, even in serving the Lord faithfully for years and years and years, all of that does not compare to what Jesus did for us on the cross. There's just no comparison. 
And sometimes, especially for those who have been with the Lord for some time, we lose sight of that, don't we? We forget that, don't we? And we begin to think, well, I think I can do this on my own with the help of Jesus here and there. Now, we don't say that, but we actually practice that in some areas of our life. But Jesus is saying, listen, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he's saying, listen, not only like before Christ, before you knew the Lord, I mean, a lot of us are probably thinking, yeah, I was there. I was helpless. He helped me. No, Jesus is not talking about just before Christ. He's talking about our whole life. He's talking about growing in an awareness and a concept that we are helpless before God in every area of our life. We need him and we need to depend on him. He said, blessed is that person for they will actually access the realm of the kingdom and everything that's a part of it. Man, I feel the fire of the Lord in here this morning. Does that make sense? It's recognizing our dire need of him in every area of our life. It's knowing, it's, it's more than just knowing this in our heads, guys. It's more than just even talking about it or even singing about it. It's, do you feel it? Like, do you feel that in you? Do you live your life in a way, I am helpless right now without you. Lord, I am dependent on you in my finances, in my relationships, in my children, in my family. Like, I am so desperately needing you to move. Like, if I don't, it, it, I, it's like death. It's like something bad's going to happen if you don't move. Man, the Lord is saying this is beautiful, even though it hurts, even though it's uncomfortable. The Lord is saying this is beautiful, and this is what I value. Those who recognize that they're spiritually bankrupt. Don't you know, guys, Jesus did this for us and said that in Philippians 2, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant. Jesus became bankrupt in a sense. He modeled this beatitude for us so that we could actually step into it. So Jesus bankrupt himself by leaving heaven and came and took on this earth suit and depended on his father the whole way through. Gosh, isn't that just beautiful? Do you feel that this morning? I don't know about you. In the last six months, I have felt that more in my life than ever. I have needed him. I have, I have needed him so much to move in my personal life through everything that's been going on and we've walked through in the last six, five months. I also know this, that if if I don't feel a part of Jesus, I realize I'm just living in darkness. We are all living in darkness if we're apart from him. So, a great point to realize. Poor in spirit doesn't go away when we're saved. It just begins. And we actually have a journey to grow in the awareness of what that looks like and means in our life. So let me give a few quick examples. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7. Let's go there. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7. I want to give an Old Testament example right here. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7 is about Solomon and David. Chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. And this is the story where Solomon actually becomes king. And he's taking over and he has a dream at night. And the Lord asks Solomon, what do you want from me? Right? This is the context where we read. Now look, in verse 7 it says, And now Solomon says, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of David my father. Although I am but a little child. I want you to note that. I do not know how to go out or I do not know how to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people from whom you have chosen, a great people too many to be numbered and counted for the multitude, to give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people so that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this group of people? Hold right there. This is Solomon we're talking about, the king. I, I will remind us. That his father David, even though he was just the second king of Israel at that time, if we look back in the list of kings now, David is still one of the most successful kings in all of the Bible. Not because of his even success and failures, so to say, but 
because of his level of knowing God, his repentant heart and his intimacy with the Lord. It's what made him so powerful and so great. I mean, he gave us all the Psalms that we have. And I, I want you to know that Solomon, it's not too far to believe this, he grew up under David's tutelage. He grew up under David mentoring him, grooming him, preparing him discipling him to be the king of Israel. He poured an investment into Solomon of what this is going to be, what it's going to look like. Solomon began to believe in God. He had his own personal faith from God, as we read here, that was apart from David. And I want to also remind us that it wasn't he was moving towards his destiny. It wasn't he was moving towards his purpose. He was in it. The crown was on his head. But did you catch what Solomon said to the Lord? He said, but Lord, I'm but a little child. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to be king. I don't know how to rule these people. I don't know how to lead these people. Guys, that's powerful. Listen to what he said. That's so powerful. Even though he had all that mentorship and discipleship from David, all those years, in this point, Solomon is saying, man, I don't know how to do this. I was prepared. I was trained. But now that I'm in it, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to lead. I don't know how to govern these people. I don't know how to fulfill the assignment that you gave me. I feel like it was probably overwhelming for Solomon in this moment. But now we know Solomon, he weren't the perfect. My man messed up. And I'm going to leave that right there. 700 wives. I mean, gosh. Gosh. Could you imagine husbands? 700 wives. 700 conversations. 700 challenges. I'm going easy, Amber. I see you. I can feel you looking at me right now. I'm not even going to look at you. So I can feel it. <laughs> Gosh, ladies, could you imagine competing with 699 other wives? I mean, I, anyway, I don't want to go too far into that. I'm just going to leave that right there. I'll let the Lord talk to you all about that. Point is, my man wasn't perfect. But yet, in this moment, he models for us what poor in Christ looks like, to be poor in spirit. He's so overwhelmed by his assignment, he goes, I don't know how to do this. He's not trying to make it happen. He's not pretending he has all the answers. He's honest with himself, and he goes, I literally do not know how to do this. Can you identify with that? I believe that if our assignments from the Lord are not overwhelming, I just wonder, are we actually seeing them correctly? Are we even seeing them clearly? There is a level of things that the Lord invites us into that are so overwhelming, that are so crushing and pressuring to the point where like, I don't know how to do this. Even though you may have all the experience and expertise, you're like, I just don't know how to do this. That's okay. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I value the person who does that. I value the heart that says that. I value the heart that actually is honest and says, even though I've been trained and I have this and I have that and I have that, I'm not leaning on that to make something up and pretend I literally don't know how to do this, even though I've been prepared for it. That's what it means to be poor in spirit, to have that attitude, right? So it's an opportunity that we could actually lean and depend on him. Now, I love God's response to Solomon. This is unbelievable. Now look at this. In verse 10, this is what the Lord responds to Solomon. Listen to this. And it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. Good job, Solomon. And God said to him, because you asked this and have not asked for yourself a long life or riches or the life of your enemies to be taken, but you've asked for your life or for yourself, understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I will now do according to your word. And God goes on to give Solomon all of those things. Guys, that is awesome. Did you catch that? God actually gives Solomon things he didn't pray for. It speaks to how important prioritizing it is in our life. Like, 
how important to prioritize our time and our schedules around the king. The Lord has a funny way that when you prioritize your life around him, that he will actually actually bless parts of your life, give you favor in parts of your life you've never prayed for or asked for. There's like a trickle effect from heaven that will flow on your life because you're not seeking the things that you actually need, but you're seeking the king in him. And the Lord says, because that faith that, that moves me, that brings favor, he goes, I'm actually going to give you all of those things because your priorities are right. Man, I wonder sometimes if a lot of our challenges in life are rooted back to, are we prioritizing our time and our schedules that are what, what are important and, important and valuable to the Lord? Gosh, do you, I want you to catch this. This is a kingdom principle. In other words, if, if you can begin to understand what the Lord values the most in your life and organize and prioritize your life around that, you will find favor hitting your life in all unexpected places. This is a Matthew 6, reality. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness in all these things shall be added unto you. What we do, what I tend to do, is seeking the things that I need that needed to be added to me, and then I ask the Lord to come on in and put his hand on it, put his favor on it, but it just doesn't work that way. But I've learned if I trust God to provide those things in his time, in his pace, and I actually just come to seek him for who he is, wow, favor just begins to pour out. Can I give a personal example? I never wanted to go back to school. Amber, we've had this conversation many times. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would actually go to a level of a doctorate degree in education. I did not want to do it, guys. After that master's, I was done. I was more than done. I was done, done, done. Done, 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 done. And I sit in a Bible study on Wednesday night in a church, and the Lord began to speak to me about it. And I was like, no, Lord. I can't, it don't make any sense. We got the 12 tribes of Israel. Amber and I have so many kids running around. They're babies. We can't keep up. We're in tent ministry. We're in this church. And how in the world am I going to have time to work on that? And it was a wrestle. It was a battle for quite a long time. But when the Lord really just revealed it to me, this was my, this is what he wanted for me. I want you to catch this. It's what he valued. I didn't have a value for it. He had a value for it. More than I did. But when I began to align myself to that and got over myself in the wrestle, and I began to actually say, okay, you actually value this as part of the journey in my life. And so because you value it, I'm going to make it my value. And so now going to school became a top value and a priority to me. That didn't make it easy. And it's for the next five years, I actually had to fight and struggle to keep that as a value and on my prioritizing schedule of my time, my energy, and my effort. I couldn't let school go to the bottom because God had such a high value for it in my life. Are you with me this morning? And so what ends up happening is, thank God, I finish. Some of you know, but if you don't know, oh my Lord, in 2022, I was called upon to give the graduation speech for the university which was a huge high honor. And God moved through that. People were saved out of that. I want, listen to that. People were saved out of that 10-minute speech, that one moment. Eternal lives were changed. Eternal destinies were changed because, not of me, but because of the Lord working through me. But I'm not talking about me. I just want to make a practical point that when I valued what God valued in my life at that level, and I prioritized my time and energy around it, then favor began to hit my life, and he gave me things I never asked for. Woo! Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize they're spiritually bankrupt because I will give them the key and kingdom of heaven. Give you, they're such a good God. He'll give you things you never even asked for or thought of. Man, that's so good. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Poor in spirit is a posture of our hearts. It's not about the work of our hands. It's about the position of our hearts. It's about our motives and our approach to God. Not what we can do for him or perform from him. 
And it's more about prioritizing our lives around him than prioritizing our lives and our plans and then inviting him into it. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. And so the starting point for that is you have to discern what does Jesus value in your life? Have you ever even asked him that? Because you might be surprised what you value is actually not what he's valuing. He's actually valuing ABC over here. And man, when you begin to connect to that, whoo, you're talking about the floodgates opening up over you. So good. All right, one more example. Let's go, just a couple more minutes. Example number two of poor in spirit. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Go with me there. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Love this. Love this teaching by Jesus. It's convicting. It's encouraging. All in the same breath. In Luke chapter 18, I believe Jesus is illustrating again what poor in spirit looks like. In chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector who go to pray at the temple. And he makes a point. Listen to this. He says, the two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and another a tax collector. And the Pharisee said, standing by himself, prayed, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like that man or that other man right there. I'm not like the extortioners or the unjust or the adulterers or even this tax collector over here. You ever been in a prayer meeting like that? Mm, I've been in my fair share. But if we're really honest, some of us all have prayed that way at some point. And he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off, look at what Jesus says, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you that this man went down to his house and he is justified. Another translation says he went down to this house and he was forgiven rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, that first Pharisee, if you listen to his prayer, he's really not praying to God. He's praying to himself. He's basically giving his spiritual resume to God. Look at all of what I have done. Look at all the works I have done. And honestly, if we're all truthful, at some point we dip and can dip into praying that way. But the tax collector is different. And the Lord makes this point. See, the tax collector recognized he was spiritually bankrupt. He recognized he was spiritually indebted to God and there was nothing he could do. He was utterly helpless without the intervention of the king of kings. There was just no way. I like to even think about when that man went home. Think about the tax collector went home, maybe went home back and his wife was there. Wife said, hey, what what'd you do today? I went to church. What'd you do? Try to extort all the preachers and the, the people at church, get money. No, I prayed. Oh, you prayed? Like God will hear your prayer? He said, yeah, he heard my prayer. And he said, I'm a forgiven man. The Pharisee wasn't forgiven, but the tax collector was forgiven because he recognized his spiritual bankruptcy. And the Lord said, that man is forgiven. That is the power of brokenness. That is the power of humility. That is the power of vulnerability before God. It is unbelievable. That man realized that apart from God, he's just living in darkness. But when Jesus said he was forgiven, yeah, I, I, it's like it changed his life. You see, forgiveness even provides a place for God's favor to rest. I want to say that again. Forgiveness provides a place for God's favor to rest on our lives. When we operate in true forgiveness, when we for receive forgiveness and we extend it and give it from a wholehearted place, there's something about God's favor that finds that. His favor is attracted to the one who forgives. He draws his attention to us and we begin to experience the true joy and contentment that Jesus is talking about for sure. But I want to talk about this a little bit further. So poor in spirit. Let me, let me make a point here. 
Poor in spirit is not self-condemnation. Poor in spirit is not self-rejecting. Poor in spirit is, is not having or carrying an unse- unhealthy sense of guilt. It's when our eyes are actually opened to see that there is darkness in our hearts apart from the grace of God. That's what being poor in spirit means, that apart from him, I actually have darkness in me. But when I'm with him in his grace and I'm connected to his grace, then I am what I am. That's what Paul says. By his grace, I am what I am. By God's grace, you are who you are. A pastor once said it this way. Poor in spirit means that we are naked before God. We have nothing to hide. We have nothing to prove. And we have nothing to give. It's knowing our place and staying there. Poor in spirit is knowing the truth of who I am. It's knowing myself. It's knowing accepting myself, being myself, all for the glory of God. Because, you know, when you're yourself, you can accept others. Poor in spirit is also not thinking too highly of myself. Poor in spirit does not say I have all the answers or I have it all figured out. Poor in spirit means I'm not going to think highly of myself. I'm not going to go in self-loathing, but I, I'm also going to be aware that I just there's some things I just don't know, and I'm okay with that. And see, you may be here right now, and you may be just sitting along taking notes, let's say, and maybe there's a few things I've already said that you're like, man, I don't agree with that. Like, I don't agree with what Mike's saying there. I don't agree with that point or even that second point. And a lot of times when we do that, we can go ahead and cancel out. And we say, well, I'm not going to listen to any more. I'm going to cancel everything else because I don't I disagree with one or the two of these points. So I'm just going to get on that phone and start scrolling, right? Right? But that's not being poor in spirit. No, being poor in spirit means I can disagree with you, but I can still listen to you. Being poor in spirit means I can disagree with you, but I can still learn from you. The worst person in this room right now has something good to offer. And the best person in this room right now has something bad to give. And having the poor in spirit helps us to recognize both. Man, is that not good? Poor in spirit actually helps us to recognize both. So we don't cancel each other out and we don't condemn ourselves. Being poor in spirit looks and seeks to listen and to understand even when there is disagreement. Because if I'm honest, when we begin to disagree with one another, it's very easy to cancel each other out. It's a struggle for us all. But the Lord is saying, I'm looking for that man. I'm looking for that woman who would actually be so humble to say that even though I don't agree with you, and that even though you are misunderstanding me, and that even though all of these things are happening, I am not going to check out of you. I am not going to tune out. I'm actually going to listen with an ear to what you're saying, even if it's painful, even if it's hard, even if it makes me cringe inside. I'm actually choosing to be poor in spirit. I'm actually choosing to listen and to love in this moment. God says to that person, I will give my kingdom. Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Becoming poor in spirit is the pathway to becoming Christ-like. It's taken some time, but I can honestly say from my heart, I could say it with my words in previous seasons of my life, but from my heart, my personal goal, you know what it is? It's to become more like Jesus. It's to become more Christ-like. I believe the end goal of all worship is to become more Christ-like. The end goal of all discipleship is to become more Christ-like. And the end goal of all outreach and evangelism and missions is to see others become more like Christ. Guys, that is the goal of the Christian walk. That is the goal 
That is the end result of where we are going and where the Lord wants to take us. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says that reality. He goes, for I have been crucified with Christ, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the pinnacle of the Christian walk. That is the goal. That is success in the kingdom's eyes. And what Jesus is saying is he's laying down the constitution of his kingdom on this Sermon of the Mount. He's saying it all begins with the posture of our hearts. Are we able to recognize that we are spiritually insufficient, that we are spiritually bankrupt, that we are helpless in every area of our life so that the grace and the kingdom and the power of God can rest on that type of weakness and honesty and vulnerability? That's what he's saying. Ooh, there's a lot more stirring in me, but I think that's a good place to land. Are you with me this morning? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to say one more thing in closing here. I think another good key to remember to being poor in spirit is not focusing on our sins, failures, and mistakes I think sometimes we can overly focus on that and we miss something. And this is what we miss. We miss the power of the goodness of God and the kindness of God and the grace of God. I've learned in different points of my life of struggles from all types of addiction. When I actually changed, when there was actually a deliverance that began to take form in my life, you know what I was met with? The kindness of God. The goodness of God. Romans 2.4 should be such a powerful word for all of us because it reveals a powerful truth of his kingdom. He says, it is the kindness of God that leads men. Listen to that. It is the kindness of God. It is not, the word is clear. He did not say it's the judgments of God. God's judgments are righteous, true, and altogether, amos. But he didn't say judgments. He didn't say justice. God is justice, and he brings justice. But in Romans 2, 4, that context, Paul is making it very clear. It is the kindness of God that actually brings us to our knees. Our sin and our failures and our mistake give us the awareness of it, but it is actually the power of God through his love over something we don't deserve that actually cripples us to our knees and we actually encounter him and experience him in a way that change, uh, changes us from the inside out. Crack cookie, 10 years. 10 years, I, I mean, I, I fought my father. We fought. I tore my family up. I wanted to die so many times, but in that moment, when I looked at him, he didn't bring a judgment to me. He didn't beat me with a rod. He said, Michael, I love you. I love you so much. I was met with the kindness of God. Years after that, I had such a battle with pornography. Such a battle. My whole life, I had a sexual battle with pornography. Even before internet was out. I mean, it was, it was terrible. Mixed that with addiction. And one night in my Bible college dormitory room, when I was so ashamed of failing, Jesus literally came into my dorm room. And he didn't bring the rod. And he didn't bring a judgment or a condemnation. He said, Michael, I understand. Yes, you're a sinner. But I want you to know something. You're my sinner. And you belong to me all the days of your life. I was met with the kindness of God. And that spirit broke off my life. And what we've just walked through as a church, what we've just been through as a church, broken me up all inside. And I said, Lord, I can't do it. I feel helpless. I feel so spiritually weak. I feel so spiritually weak that I've ever been in my life. But I wasn't met with the correction of God or the rod of God. I was met with his kindness and his mercy. That's what it means to be poor in spirit and, and, and growing in our awareness that we are, are helpless without him in every area of our lives. 
the Apostle Paul's life. I know we're getting a few minutes past, but I feel the Lord so strongly here. The Apostle Paul's life. Worship team, can you come up here, Jacob? And them? The Apostle Paul's life. If you watch his life through his ministry, I don't have it up here. I almost did it, and I did it today. But in the beginning of his ministry, in the book of Galatians, he makes this statement. He's basically defending his apostleship because they're super apostles and they're preaching heresy and all these things. And Paul makes this declaration, well, I'm an apostle. He's defending his apostleship. But if you read five years later from that, you'll read that Paul goes, man, I am the least of all the apostles. I'm the, I'm the least of all the apostles. And five years after that, in Ephesians, Paul makes another statement. I am the least out of all the believers in the church of God. What a statement. And then the last part of his life, when he writes Timothy, right before he dies, 20 years now into this journey, you know what he tells Timothy? He said, man, I am, not I was, I am the chief of all sinners. Do you see that? Paul was growing in his humbleness. He was growing in his humility. He was growing in this awareness of what it looks like to be poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit. And the kingdom of heaven was granted to him. Man, I want to encourage us this morning that Jesus will never let you down. Man will let you down. Leaders will let us down. The Lord will never let you down. And with your brokenness and with your hurt and your pain, you can trust him. Can you stand with me this morning? Gosh, if you're here, I, I mean, in this moment, I just want to give an opportunity for you to pray, to come forward and pray. You know, sometimes we have specific things in altar call. Right now, I don't feel that. I feel that whatever it is, whatever it is that you need to connect with the Lord on, that you need to pray through, that you need to release or ask for something, He is in this room right now. He is literally in this room. And I want to call you forward. There's something about, it's not trying to get you up here. There's something about an act of faith that agrees with what he wants to do in your life. And I feel like there's some of you he wants to just even speak a word to. He wants to reveal a word. Some of you, I feel, are in a directional change in your life. And you're looking for confirmation. I think he wants to give you that confirmation today. Some of you need to let something go. And I feel like this is an appropriate moment to do that. For some that have been really struggling personally, I feel like it's that tax collector moment. Just come before him. Acknowledge it. Yes, I am a sinner. I've messed up. And then let his grace, let his mercy, let his forgiveness wash over you. So whatever it is this morning, I want you to come forward. Come forward and, and speak to Jesus. Talk to him. Whatever it is. Let him examine your heart. If you don't know Jesus, please come see me or one of the leaders here. We would love to pray with you. We would love to see you walk into the kingdom of heaven. Shoo. It is his kindness. It is his kindness and his goodness. Jesus, you're so kind. You're so good, Lord. Your love is unbelievable. Would you reveal your glory here this morning? And reveal your kindness. I, I just feel there's such a word. Some of you just need to experience kindness. He's a kind God. He's a kind God. Lord, let your kindness come forth in this place. Just worship me for a moment.
all across this room. Just talk to him for a moment. Tell him your heart. Share your burden with him. He knows it. Show us your glory, Lord. Yeah, that's good, Jacob. Keep singing that, brother. Just tell him. Just tell him whatever you're going through. He understands. He gets it. I feel some of you just need to let out a good cry. Some of you just need to let out some tears. Some of you need to let out some shouts. It's okay. I've cried more in this season of my life than I've ever had. God, you're so good, Jesus. You're so good. Show us your glory in this place, Lord. Moses asked, show us your glory. Show us your presence. Let's just worship the Lord right here. Let's sing that together, guys. Show me your glory. My God. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. My God. Show me your glory. Come on, I want you to find somebody next to you. Just grab the person next to you. Let's get together. I want to just pray over us as we go out this morning. Let's bless each other that we will walk in being poor in spirit. That we would grow in our awareness of what that means. Go ahead and just begin to pray for your partner. Begin to pray for your neighbor right now. Just declare that over them. Jesus, we declare... Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to become more Christ-like. Help us to have the right posture 
to be poor in spirit, to be poor in Christ, to be poor in the spirit. To recognize our dependence on you. To be okay. To say that we're not okay. Oh Lord, grow us in that. Grow every person in this house watching online. Thank you, Lord. It's a value. And because you value that, we value that, Lord. Woo. Ah, oh, we thank you. Lord, we thank you, Father. We bless your holy name. Father, we thank you for our gathering together. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for your presence, for the healing of bodies, for what you have done here today. We give you all of the glory, all of the honor and praise. You are worth it all, King Jesus. And Lord, I just declare that this week is actually going to be a great week, that this is going to be a fantastic week for this house, for this church, for the families here, that I just speak, it's going to be a fantastic week. It is going to be a blessed week. Lord, that you are going to meet us with your surprises and your good graces in favor, in joy, in love, in hope, in healing, in grace, in peace, in kindness. We declare that over this house. Lord, that this is your house. You are the chief shepherd. Man, you are the chief elder. And we just follow you, Lord. We choose to follow you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd be with our kids as they return to schools, that the glory of God would saturate our schools, that something would begin to shift in our school system in this county, that you would move mightily through students and on students in the days ahead. So, Lord, we thank you, and we bless you, and we give you the glory and honor. And everybody said... Amen.